Kwame Kubule is the founder of KIO Advisory Services. He was co-author of the landmark Black Economic Empowerment Commission report, which was presented to former President Thabo Mbeki and paved the way for the country's current broad-based Black Economic Empowerment laws and policy, policies. He's editor of the book, Making Mistakes, Writing Wrongs, Insights into BEE, and he has also served as a member of the COSATU panel of progressive economists. Now, Duma's here on this panel because he's done a, a huge amount of research into nationalization and he's looked at a lot of countries. So he's going to present lots of case studies to us today. Um, but um, Duma also has some views on the new mining charter. So he's going to be critiquing that for us as well this morning. Over to you. Thanks, Thank Duma. Thank you very much. Um, so um, so now, now, when I started off with this um, whole journey around mining, I thought that, um, I wondered why should we bother with the whole issue of mining? Um, mining is a sunset industry, but when you look into the whole uh, detail about this industry, you realize that it is not a sunset industry. Between 1994 and 2009, we had a collapse in gold employment and a collapse in gold production. But everything else grew uh, significantly. Platinum group metals almost doubled. Um, Chrome, manganese trebled in size, and so forth. So, an iron ore um, doubled in terms, doubled and trebled and whatever in terms of revenues. So, I began to see no, it is not a sunset industry. We should be looking at it a bit more. And then I realized later on that mining is actually very different to other industries. Um, non renewable um, mineral resources should be treated differently from other sources of wealth in the economy. They are not created by the efforts of those people um, who own the land. In most industries, private property owners, including communities, do not have rights to the mineral resources due to the fortuitous fact that it's below your gar garden. And extraction renders them unavailable to others, including later generations. So the resource owner, the state on behalf of the people, must be compensated, and that is why we have royalties. And it is publicly owned in most countries. Now, on that thing, I would say that the Anglo-Saxon countries, you know, the England, the Canada, the UK, as you said, Ronnie, um, and Australia, they have, pri they have a private sector-driven model, but everywhere else in the world, state ownership is part of the mix of policies that are used to advance development. I was thinking of, um, Christina Kirshner, when she um, nationalized, renationalized YPF, the National Oil and Gas Company, she says, we must be the only country in Latin America, in fact, the only country in the world that does not control our national resources. And she had forgotten to mention South Africa. So globally, the situation is that about 90% of oil reserves um, and oil production is state-owned. When you get to mining, it's about 24 to 25% is state owned. So you'll see that. So man, so the mineral resources belong to the nation, not the multinationals who mine them. And I think that gets lost in the debate in South Africa. Eco partners found that the mineral resources of our country were worth 4.7 uh, trillion rands, double the city um, group uh, estimate, and that's equivalent to 1 million rands per citizen. So what I say is that the state must develop and manage the natural resources in a manner that extracts maximum benefit for the citizens. It's a pure economic issue. There must be a public benefit. The public benefit must be in addition to normal tax revenues that apply to industries which are not publicly owned, a restaurant, a bank, or whatever, yeah. And in South Africa, we collected about 20 billion rand in corporate income taxes. That's less than 1% of total state revenue. And we also collected, I think we're going to collect this year in the budget, 6.5 billion rands in terms of royalties. So in addition, so it has to be in addition to normal tax revenues because this is a different industry. And second, it has to be in addition to BE requirements because BE applies to all industries. It's nothing specifically uh, that is replies to mining. However, in the mining sector, and we are reviewing the BE charter this year, the mining charter, it has significantly lower benchmarks and targets for transformation than the rest of the economy where the BEE codes apply. So just quickly, I've argued about this, I've had big fights with the minister about this. I believe that the mining part charter is a 
not worth the paper it is written on. It must be completely changed. It's a betrayal of the principles of true empowerment that we have developed over 20 years. It's a primitive policy tool overtaken by advances in the measurement and monitoring of BEE. It has no numerical targets for most indicators. It does not have a rigorous measurement system and scorecard with clear definitions to reduce possibilities of different interpretations. It does not develop a system to monitor in implementation manually. There's a lack of a mechanism to independently verify the BE contributions. And it's got disturbingly low targets for employment equity and black women. The target in the amended mining charter was 40% by 2014. And the target ref includes white women. Who are so what happens is that when they set that target, Neil, the, the figures had already been achieved including white women. And I never at the time when I started getting really worried about NOM is to understand why they signed a document that has targets that had been achieved a few years ago. And it, I failed to understand it, yeah. So there were no targets in that charter for black people, black women, disabled employees. And for the BEE partners, there was no uh, targets for net value attributable to black shareholders. So what I'm trying to say is that the benchmark for transformation in the mining industry is much lower than applies in anywhere else in the country. Now, I just wanted to quickly look at the international best practices. As Fazila said, I've looked at many countries. Uh, obviously, it must be located within a national vision for economic growth and development. It must be located within a national vision for natural resources. It's about developing the state's capacity to um, lead the sector. It's about developing measures uh, there's this delic lovely word called a government take system to extract a fair share of natural resource rents. And you've got to develop measures to manage and invest the natural resource rents. And you have to diversify the economy away from natural resources. Now, the left discourse focuses on beneficiation and diversification. They forget about everything else that you have to do above that um, seventh thing. Now, in terms of a national vision for growth and development, I think the Asian Tigers have shown that it is possible to move from extreme poverty to achieve the status of a newly industrialized country in one generation, and there have been two explanations. The first one is called the developmental state theory, where it's about a developmental mindset, straight state-driven, planned, and focused on production, then there's a certain organizational structure of this developmental state with a powerful bureaucracy that is insulated and autonomous but embedded in society with a pilot agency and operational agency and close ties with industry. And there's also economic growth theory, which unpacks the components of economic growth according to the factors of production, labor, capital, and productivity. And what they found is that um, you if you combine both approaches, I find that you have a mobilizing... All these countries that have grown fast, they have a mobilizing vision and plan. There was the income doubling plan of, Jamaica, of Japan, the Malaysia Vision 2020, where they said in, th in 30 years, we will be eight times the size that we are today in 1990 when they developed this. And lately, I've been to Ethiopia Vision 2025. If you were looking for an African country that is following exactly the same model with a slightly authoritarian bent, um, <laughs> there you must look to Ethiopia. But if you look at the numbers coming out of Ethiopia in terms of economic growth, employment, and all of those things, they are stunning. I mean, it's only beaten by um, Angola with the oil wealth. Um, and Angola is tapering off. Um, it's also about the state's capacity capacity to initiate growth and development. It's about high rates of capital formation, human capital upgrading, industrial upgrading. And then the last one is macroeconomic policy. Now, macroeconomic policy, the heterodox approach in many of these countries, it uses multiple tools. It goes beyond what Keynes said, the social democratic um, tools. And they use multiple tools and multiple targets. Um, they have the tools include exchange rates, state control of finance, reserve requirements, capital controls, prescribed asset requirements, credit quotas, and differential interest rates. Now, back this, the national vision for natural resources, Norway's 10 oil commandments, they were developed in 1970, and it's a set of instru instructions that were given to parliament as to how they must manage their oil resources. There was national management and control for all activities on the Norwegian continental shelf. Um, state involvement at all levels to, advi to advance Norwegian interests and promote development of the Norwegian industrial cluster. Um, you are talking about Norway went the state ownership model, 
and um, the UK went, uh, I went to university in Scotland, so I know about Aberdeen. Yeah, I know exactly what, <laughs> how little the people benefited, and I'm now sympathizing with the Scottish people with their independence, whatever, yeah. So establishment of a state oil company, self-sufficiency in securing oil supplies, and establishing new business activities in the sector and the prohibition of gas flaring. In terms of state capacity, this determines whether a resource endowment can be a curse or a blessing. Norway has a clear separation, this is important for us, separation of policy, regulatory and commercial functions. Nigeria, the Nash, they've mixed up the roles and they've now passed new legislation that adopts the Norwegian model. Now, extractive capacity is the other type of capacity. In 1996, Botswana had a GDP per capita of 60 pula, 12 kilometers of paved roads, and 100 Botswana who had completed secondary school and 22 university graduates. Um, people say, but Duma, do we have the capacity to manage the sector? Look at Botswana. In three years later, they had a 15% share in Debswana, which was increased to 50% in 1975. So today, Botswana has a high level of extractive capacity. They have good management of resource rents, but they failed dismally to develop the state capacity to diversify the economy away from diamonds. Norway, Norway had a something called the state direct financial interest, which holds minority stakes in companies, and a national oil company, which has majority stakes in companies. Zambia owned and managed, and it is a disaster. Botswana, so people have said, maybe we should do Botswana. It, they nationalize the same company, Anglo-American. Botswana owns, but not, does not manage, so people are saying, that's the reason why that one was successful, and the Zambian one wasn't. But no, um, Zambia was a disaster, but Chile owns and manages successfully. So we have to look in a bit more into the reasons for these things. Now, the extracting of a fair share of natural resource rents. To me, this is an unemotional issue, and in between the false dichotomies of nationalization and privatization, there are as many ways of slicing the rent uh, as there are countries in the world, and each model is unique. There are various combinations of state equity, tax regimes, the windfall tax, the resource rent tax, and the royalties, and contract types, the production sharing agreements, the JVs, and the concessions. And there are various means of paying. People say you'll bankrupt our country, and they put up the straw man, and you say, so basically, you do not have to pay up front or at all. So the IMF has got a to-do list of how to do it, and they say you can have paid up terms on commercial terms, you can have paid up on concessional terms, you can have a carried equity interest, as in Norway, where if me as a state, I, am, am, I will now want to get into this oil field, I will take 20% of this oil field. You, as the private partners, you must pay for my participation, and you must pay for my share of investment. That is how it works in other countries. The, you can pay for equity out of production proceeds, like the BEE deals, and you can swap tax for equity, and you can have equity for non-cash contributions, such as providing infrastructure. This is all on the, from the IMF, which has done a lot of good work advising companies, how, countries how to get state ownership. Now, what we've seen, Joel Nechitenz, I went to a lot of workshops with him, he says, why should we go through the pain of um, nationalization when we can do it through the tax system? But I say no. State equity trumps tax revenue, especially during the recent boom. It can't be off the table. And in many of the countries that you talk about in, in South America, it is popular because the people can see the benefits of the industry. Yeah. Now, why is uh, state equity important? State equity can appropriate all the rents in the industry, theoretically. Not theoretically, even practically. Saudi Arabia is a good example. Mexico for 75 years until December 2013 when they had that thing in, in their Congress. Every single oil, there is not a single international oil company that operates off the s out on the, on the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. And Brazil in their oil and gas industry for 44 years until 1997. So you can't have a tax regime that takes all the rents in the industry. And secondly, you can't develop taxes that replicate the take systems in countries such as Norway. In Norway, 90%, the state share of the industry you talked is about, is about 80 to 90%. In Botswana, the government share, if you include royalties and the taxes and everything, Botswana gets 75% of every diamond that is sold in the world. And in Venezuela, the state share is 70%. So you can't replicate a tax system that takes so much because beyond a certain level of tax, there will be no investors in the industry. I hope that is clear to many people. Now, Codelco, Ch Chile, very good case study. 
Codelco has got 30% of the industry and the multinationals, Anglo-American, all of them, have got 70%. Between 2000, during the boom years, between 2004 and 2008, Codelco paid taxes of $30 billion. And they accumulated in their copper fund, the Copper Stabilization Fund, $20 billion, 15% of GDP. Just before the financial crisis um, started, there were people um, doi doing uh, at the finance minister say, no, you've got to spend this money. You can't be... Um, you can't be um, accumulating the money while we are in crisis. So between 2006, when they introduced a higher royalty regime, and 2012, Codelco paid taxes of $42 billion to the government, and the top 10 copper producers, which do all the copper production, paid only 29.2 billion rand. So what I'm trying to say is that in Chile, they extract more from Codelco than they extract from all the private sector who are double the size of Codelco. And a mixed model, some people argue, gets the best of both worlds, from meaningful state intervention, credibility in front of the people in terms of what you can extract for the people, and private participation. Quickly, the Norwegian case study. I said they have got minority interests. So people say, Duma, how are we going to do this? We can't run at ESCOM. We can't run um, Transnet. So I say there's something that takes minority interest. It's called the state direct financial interest. In 2010, it had assets of $144 billion. And then the national oil company, government owns 67%. It had $54 billion in 2010. So in 2010, when I looked at this, there was $200 billion business interest that the government had in Norway. And then they have taxes and other charges and fees. Now, in 2009, they collected $46 billion from these sources, 27% um, from state revenue. And the, all the revenue is invested in the Sovereign Wealth Fund. I'll talk about that quickly. Um, Venezuela case study. The industry was nationalized. Okay, sorry, yeah. It was nationalized in 1976. Chavez did not nationalize. He just changed the terms of the 18 international oil companies and took control of 80 crude services companies. So what the situation is in Venezuela is that 70% is produced by the state-owned company and the other 30% is produced by these 16 um, international oil companies. So basically the situation is that before Chavez came to power, GDP, there had been a, a collapse of the country's economy. Until 1970, the early 70s, Venezuela was the fastest growing economy in Latin America and even the world. It was the richest cu uh, country in Latin America by far. And then from the two decades until Chavez took over, there was a collapse of economic growth. And it is attributed to be towards um, declining per capita fiscal revenues from the state oil company. When Chavez took over in 2003, um, obviously he turned, um, he turned the the, the mandate of this company towards serving the people, and there were massive gains in terms of um, in terms of poverty reduction. Now, the problems with the Venezuelan models are mostly around the macroeconomic policy. Um, most of the surplus was spent on consumption spending. Some of it very useful in terms of grants and social spending, and the exchange rate was allowed to become overvalued. Uh, and the gr after the global financial crisis, they had an austerity program. Uh, I'm not sure why they did it. Nobody understands why they did it, and the economy plunged for two years. And then now they've got a currency crisis, and you're seeing the people, on the rich people on the streets um, in uh, Venezuela. And but it's a self-made currency crisis. There's no reason why Venezuela should have a currency crisis. They had oil revenues of 100 billion dollars. They've got a current account surplus of 11 billion dollars, and they've got foreign exchange reserves of 40 billion dollars. So why should a country with so many resources allow itself to have a currency crisis? That's another story. Thank you.